before the manosphere came the fall of masculine interests. Masculine interests. Those two words aren't often used in our society, at least not in a positive way. Indeed, since the 1960s, masculinity itself has been pretty battered. With the rise of feminism and the reconstructing of our society in the post-World War II era, the patriarchy has been under unrelenting attack. You can't have been male in the last 30 years and not felt the heat. Sexual harassment, imperialism, globalization, slavery, pollution, environmental degradation. If you had a penis, you were culpable, if not directly responsible. And you had to have the empathy of a brick not to feel that sting. Men are violent. Men are criminals. Men are inherently sexist. Men are rapists. Men are evil businessmen bent on destroying the earth in pursuit of corporate dominance and expensive bimbos. Men are inherently oppressive. Fatherhood is unnecessary and possibly superfluous. Men are cheaters. Men are liars. Men are warmongering fools. Men are idiots. And the more masculine the man, and the more of those awful traits he is expected to have, the more he was held out for castigation by popular culture. Long before politically correct became a buzzword, the idea that masculinity was incompatible with modern civilization became the ironic focus of much of both popular and academic thought since the 1940s. Add in the factors of race and class, and the message was clear. The great abundance and high standard of living that men in the West had given the world through industrialization was not a sufficient enough achievement to excuse them from the pain and suffering they caused along the way. Coming out of World War II, that was a big deal. The world had recoiled in horror at the Great War, which saw thousands slaughtered in moments thanks to mechanized warfare, from gas to air power to tanks and machine guns. It had been the war to end all war, and the stunned civilian population had, indeed, begun a concerted movement towards peace in its make. But that horror paled in comparison next to the terrors of the 1930s and 1940s. The collapse of the financial system and the subsequent Great Depression made a mockery of the progress of the 1920s. Famine, disease, malnutrition, unemployment, and infant mortality reared their heads in every part of the world. In response, the rival militant philosophies of Marxism and fascism struggled for control of what was left, leading inevitably to war. New and improved war. Mechanized war gave way to industrialized war. Total war, in three dimensions, with no place safe from aerial bombardment. Millions died in every part of the world, not merely on a few select battlefields, as had been the case in World War I. Nanjing, Dresden, Coventry, London, Paris, Singapore. All over the world, the tendrils of the war reached with mechanical deadlines. But that wasn't the worst. Fascism had begot Nazism, which nearly led to the systematic industrial extermination of an entire ethnicity. The camps, the ovens, the bodies, they all demonstrated the Nazis' brutality, efficient methodology, bereft of humanity. Never had such horror been seen in the world, a horror wrought by men, born of a fanatical desire to order the undesirable out of existence. 
And now, thanks to the magic of film, it was seen all over the world. But even that brutal genocide wasn't the worst. The war ended with development of the most powerful weapon in history, the atomic bomb. Over 100,000 civilians were wiped out the first time it was employed. It took one plane with a crew of seven. Never had so few been directly responsible for the deaths of so many in one attack. When Robert Oppenheimer said, I am death, destroyer of worlds, he was speaking about one world in particular. For the first time in human history, we had the capability to wipe out not just the people we didn't like, but all people, everywhere. Atomic war brought the concept of racial extermination to the eye of the world with brutal focus. Man had to figure out a way to eliminate man. Or, actually, men had. Men led the nations. Men led the militaries. Men led the universities and the science departments and the projects that led to the development of atomic weaponry. Men had brought fascism and Nazism and Marxism and communism to plague a world already plagued with tanks, bombers and machine guns. Men had cold-bloodedly planned and executed the premeditated extermination of an entire culture had escorted the victims to their death and had dealt with the aftermath. So at the end of the war, it shouldn't have been a surprise that men, as men, felt a huge, powerful burden of guilt about what their fellow men had done. Defeating the Nazis and the Japanese Empire seemed to pale in comparison to the atomic genie they'd unleashed on the world. Even the heroic, felt their victory stained by the sin of atomic warfare. Whether they expressed that guilt by advocating against the further nuclear development as Einstein and Oppenheimer did, or by embracing the danger by engineering the madness of mutually assured destruction, the post-war atomic period began with guilt for the past and hope for the future, and continued until the hope was replaced with resigned complacency about the future of the human race, and they were distracted from their guilt by the wonders of the new age. But the guilt? It never went away. Men had sinned against all of humanity in our quest for power and control, and even good men with the best intentions had failed to prevent such horrific catastrophes. All the toys and police actions and new gadgets in the world couldn't make the memory of Dresden, Auschwitz and Hiroshima go away. We couldn't justify and rationalize it away any way we pleased, but the fact was it never went away. Men were responsible and we knew it. One would think that in the face of such a titanic crime that the spiritual realm would provide answers. But in this case, Christianity was culpable. From the good Christians who bombed other good Christians to death all over Europe, to the good Christians who pushed Jews into the ovens and open graves, to the good Christians who prayed before unleashing atomic death on an unsuspecting civilian population, there were few spiritual refuge left in the religion. It simply was not designed to handle crimes of that magnitude. Even the biblical plagues of Egypt paled in comparison to the Holocaust and the bomb and assorted crimes against humanity. The Catholic Church was heavily divided, literally by the separation of Europe in the wake of its near paralysis during the war. As many good Catholics fought on one side as the other, and the issue of the Holocaust especially confounded the church's ability to cope. As far as the Protestants' faiths, they were just as divided and torn about the horror and just as unable 
to formulate a response. The Bible was just not designed to deal with the aftermath of genocide and weapons of mass destruction. It barely survived trying to fit a couple of unknown continents into its mythology. The followers of the Prince of Peace had brought the worst sort of war to the world. The most they could do was indulge in navel-gazing, ecclesiastical bickering over ritual and dogma, allowing the big questions of the 20th century go unanswered by religion. The institutional religions all had a great deal invested in the status quo. The last thing they wanted to do in the early part of the Cold War was lend aid and comfort to the enemy by considering the humanity and morality of both total war and nuclear extinction. Instead, they doubled down on the Holocaust, hoped people wouldn't look too closely, and pushed to distract everyone by backing the establishment of a Jewish state to ease their guilt. But Hiroshima and Auschwitz were blows that Christianity never truly recovered from. Between the atheistic communists of the East and the secular military-industrial establishment in the West, both were wary of any strong religious voice, and both were willing to use political power to punish those denominations that rocked the boat. That didn't stop thousands of people of conscience from addressing the matters on their own in the context of religion. But Christianity, by and large, was whistling past the graveyard when it came to its moral responsibilities. As a result, membership, mandated by state decree for nearly a thousand years, fell off dramatically after they opened the ovens at Auschwitz and dropped the bomb. Christianity simply had no answers to those big questions. Instead, it distracted itself and its declining membership with attempts to recapture the spirit that had conquered most of the world with evangelical fervor. It went from being a highly respected moral power in the world to a minor aspect of life that more and more people decided they didn't need in the modern world. And while Catholicism was totally moribund, the Protestants, unbound by strict doctrine or overstressed by organization, were free to jump on the social bandwagon of anti-biblical activities by the secular world to distract everyone from the fact that it had largely been Christians who had performed industrialized warfare, industrialized murder, and supersized atomic bombs. Homosexuality perversion, licentiousness, the moral decay of society, rock and roll, and comic books were all fair game. The problem was that Christianity was developed in its present form at the height of the agricultural revolution and perpetuated and refined a system designed with land ownership, feudal obligations, and very specific classes in mind. By 1900, not much of that was still relevant anymore, and as industrialization rocked the foundation of our society, marriage and family, religion's hold over those social institutions weakened to the point of impotency. The era of the patriarchy, the father as the head of the household and representative of the larger patriarchy, was dying as the need for a strong inheritance system and a large family faded. Marriage 1.0 was doomed even before World War II, but it took a while for the society and laws to catch up with the cultural shift. Of course, there are always those who cling to the glories of the past and see them as blueprints for fixing the future. In the case of the Manosphere, the epitome of those who wish to return to that ag age traditional marriage cling to scripture for support. But often it is the church itself that seems to be obstructing their desire to live a religious, biblically-inspired life. 
They are the traditional and conservative Christians. And that's where we'll begin our survey of the Manosphere.